trying to pull him up here. Dr. Mike, I'm gonna spotlight you. All right, so we have um, uh, another presentation uh, that's gonna be uh, equally dynamic. And uh, anytime you bring a chef on board, it's gonna, you know, it's that um, superstar element, like, yay, a chef's here. <laughs> um, but he's a cardiologist as well. I'm gonna read just a real, um, I'm gonna read a, a quick bio and then let him get into his presentation. So Professor Michael Fenster, MD, is better known as Chef Dr. Mike. He's one of a handful of physicians worldwide to hold both culinary and medical degrees and is the only interventional cardiologist and professional chef to do so. He is also the only cardiologist with joint academic appointments in the, both the medical and culinary arts. Through his culinary medicine university courses, speaking events, articles, books, personal outreach, and television and other media appearances, Chef Dr. Mike empowers people to take control of their health, wellness, and happiness through positive relationship with food. His mission is to help each of us re-engage, re-forge, and reconnect our personal relationship with the food we eat. In the quality of our own food experience, experiences lie the keys to our own health, wellness, and happiness. Dr. Mike is an adjunct professor of culinary medicine at the Kansas Health Science Center and is on the faculty of the Missoula College Culinary Arts Program at the University of Montana and the College of Health School of Public Health at the University of Montana. He's an editor-in-chief culinary medicine section of the Journal of Integrated Healthcare. So Dr. Mike, thank you for being here. I'm gonna let you take it away. Thank you so much, Marla. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay. So if you and can if, start sharing your slides, it's gonna <clears throat> Yeah, if somebody could, um, let's see. Oh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Uh, there we go. And let me know if you can uh, see that. And I am going to- uh... You're all set, uh, Chef. Okay, uh, give me one second there. Okay, um, and you can and you can see my screen, correct? Yep. Okay, great. Well, hello everyone. A pleasure to be here today, albeit virtually, with you at this inaugural Food as Medicine conference. I'd like to start the program this morning by inviting you to join me on a journey. It is an exploration, a tale as simple and straightforward on its surface as the story of our food and us. In 1825, two months before his death, Jean Altham Brulat Savaron wrote in his posthumously published best selling book, The Physiology of Taste, or Meditations on Transcendental Gastronomy Tell me what you eat, and I will tell you who you are. It is a beautifully succinct and powerful formula to decipher the mystery between what we eat, our health, and our happiness. It is a course so direct and simple that it has served as a compass star for the science of nutrition. The science of nutrition ostensibly launched just over 100 years after the physiology of taste was published with the discovery of vital amines or vitamins as we know them today by Dr. Casimir Funk in 1912. Within just 50 years, the majority of deficiency diseases associated with vitamin poor diets had been identified and in many cases eradicated around the globe. The success of this focused one variable, one effect tactic was nothing short of revolutionary. It seemed as if we stood on the precipice of understanding all that we needed to know to realize the connection between what we ate and who we are, between our food and our health. But reality has a habit of being inconvenient. When we dig deeper, the truth, and thus the reality is often much more complex than it seems on the surface. Once, we looked to the horizon and saw that the earth appeared flat. And with the coming dawn each day from that same horizon, we watched the sun move through the sky until it again dipped below the horizon and ushered in the night. All that we saw and all that we experienced made sense when viewing our world as a little flat island that stood in the center of a universe that revolved around us. Except, as we now know, that was never the case. The Earth is a planetary sphere, just one of several that spins like a top as it circles a rather average star in the outer portions of the Milky Way. The relationships that govern the universe, from the largest heavenly bodies to the very fabric of reality, are complicated. 
in just such a way we humans in our relationships, particularly those that surround food, are also complicated. This universe that you experience as it experiences you is a collection of events that we refer to as our lives. Every so often we engage particular events that as a storm appearing to a ship at sea cause us to change our course. I'd like to share just such a happenstance with you, something that changed my trajectory some years ago. I was on call in a rather prestigious hospital in the Pacific Northwest on a Friday evening. The hospital was located in a pretty hip city known for its cutting edge cuisine and a long tradition of fantastic local product, including delicious and fresh seafood. At 2 a.m., I get a phone call from the emergency room physician. Hey, Mike, I got a young lady down here with classic chest pain and the ECG is a little bit abnormal. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind taking a look at it because she's only 24 years old and it's probably nothing, but it's definitely a little bit worrisome. I took a look at the ECG and called him back. Yeah, I agree. Statistically, given her age, it's a near zero probability and ECG is not 100% definitive, but it sounds like she's got classic chest pain that's not getting better. And if it wasn't for her age, we'd already have her in a cath lab. Let's just take her down there and be sure. And if it's nothing cardiac, we can all sleep a little easier. The next morning, as I was doing rounds, I stopped by the room to chat since we'd have put a stent in her diagonal artery for an acute myocardial infarction. At 24, she had a heart attack and would be on medications and suffer the sequelae of this for the rest of her life. We started to talk about her risk factors and the choices she had made. She didn't smoke or do drugs and didn't have a significant family history. However, she was morbidly obese and clearly had that type 2 diabetes precursor metabolic syndrome. We spoke for about 45 minutes regarding her dietary choices. She broke down and actually cried several times, saying she wanted to eat better, tried to eat better, but it's all so confusing. And since in her mind, there wasn't any clear consensus on what or how to eat, she confessed that she did the easiest thing possible. She ate fast food, went to drive throughs snacked at home on junk food, and things pre-prepared because it was easy and often cheap. As I'd been there a bit, I managed to be present for a lunchtime delivery. And what did the hospital send in? What kind of message, what kind of instruction, what kind of example were we going to impart upon her? After all, when she leaves the hospital, what she will remember is that after her heart attack, this is what the experts gave her to eat. Some deli turkey and American processed cheese-like food substance on white bread. Piled high on the plate next to the sandwich were a number of condiments and little squeegee packets. The ubiquitous green jello was actually on her tray. The final component was a salad. It consisted of iceberg lettuce and cherry tomatoes that had clearly never seen a ray of sunshine. They were so hard you could have played ping pong with them. This was, by obvious design, to be topped off with the processed omega-6 rich vegetable oil loaded with artificial preservatives, flavors, and other bits. As I looked at that, I thought to myself, my God, what have we done? To understand where we are, as George Santayana advised, we must understand where we began. And where we began as human beings is arguably with our first meal. As social primates, the ritual food has become as interwoven in our DNA as our blood type. This occurred the moment the first chefs crafted the first Macedon burgers and we all gathered around the fire to listen to the first stories. There, under the deep velvetite of the African savanna sky, we felt the warmth and protection of fire and fellowship and food and snug with our full bellies, there was no going back. For the human species, eating is an all-encompassing food experience. Sharing the food experience is social currency and mating ritual. Eating is fun. Eating is about pleasure. Eating is play. We are the only species on the planet that takes the time to prepare and cook our food. As Homo sapiens sapiens, we live to eat. Now, I'd like you to recall a moment when you were forced to eat something because you were told it was good for you. Maybe it was broccoli or Brussels sprouts and your mom told you you had to eat your veg. Maybe it was endless bowls of plain white rice as part of an elimination diet. Whatever it was, think about how you felt when you had to eat specifically for purpose. It became work. And although I'm not a gambling man, I bet the whole experience was less than pleasant. This is how we dictate to people to eat for health and wellness. We admonish them they must eat to live. 
But chefs are keen to an obvious something that has escaped those of us wearing scientific blinders. Most people don't consider eating an act of work, never have, never will. There is a consequence to the physiology and biology of our food experience being processed in the same areas of the brain as sex. A pizza napolitano made with organic wheat, fresh buffalo mozzarella from grass-fed cattle, heirloom organic tomatoes just harvested from their sun-drenched spots and topped with verdant basil from our own windowsill garden. These are the real ingredients we and our gut microbiome have evolved over millennia to thrive upon. So how'd we lose our way? To answer that, let us rejoin our quest several hundred thousands of years later in our own modern times. Following World War II, the industrial production of foodstuffs led to fundamental changes in our food and food pathways. These influences manifested in the cultural zeitgeist of the times from which the principles of McDonaldization, efficiency, calculability, predictability and control arose and from which we are still bearing scars and repercussions. One of these fundamental food pathway changes came at the end of the war with a surplus of munitions and manufacturing still geared towards such production. Subsequently, a use for these nitrogen and phosphorus based compounds as chemical fertilizers was introduced. Industrial and particularly monocrop agriculture became widespread and secured a foothold with government support in the form of incentives and subsidies that still exist today. The practice became entrenched worldwide when Norman Borlaug launched the Green Revolution in the 1960s, a revolution that was as much about defeating communism as it was about feeding anyone chemicals in the form of fertilizers and pesticides became the new faith. They replaced established schemas that worked in concert with natural ecosystems. These are actions that echo today in the aisles of every supermarket and on the shelves of every pantry. At the same time, crop agriculture was undergoing its transformation, animal husbandry became animal science. Easy access to things like manufactured vitamin D and antibiotics, which also speed up the animal's growth rate, made it feasible and profitable for the first time in history to concentrate animals inside and confine them there all year long. In 2011, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration reported that 80% of all antibiotics used in the United States every year go to America's livestock and poultry. Of that 80%, the FDA reported, over 90% is given to animals that are not sick. Up to 75% of the treated animals pass active drug into their feces and urine, entering the, the environment in full force and effect. Pharmaceutical residues generally pass unmeasured through wastewater treatment facilities that have not been designed to deal with them. A typical confinement hog effluent contains hundreds of distinct contaminants, including heavy metals, hormones, pesticides, and pathogens. Such operations are the main mechanism of manufacturing commodity meat and poultry, and increasingly fish and seafood are being produced in this fashion as well. All of these processes are incredibly dependent on energy intensive, particularly fossil fuel intensive feed production. In the United States, approximately 55% of grains grown are utilized in concentrated animal feeding operations. Destruction of nature's complex systems is another marker of alteration to our native food pathways. Agriculture has become much, much too simplified. The solution, according to Jonathan Lundgren, a former USDA entomologist and farmer, is creating farming systems that are more like nature with variety and complexity. Nature abhors monoculture, biodiversity is life. We see that truth reflected in the health of our own gut microbiome and its relation to our own health and wellness, or disability and disease. Network systems like those used in regenerative agriculture are more akin to the complexity found in nature. These ecosystems produce organic, real, and authentic foods in a fashion that renders them in the state from which we and our gut microbiome co-evolved to bring us pleasure, health, sustenance, and wellness, all the while addressing in a positive fashion issues of sustainability and planetary health. We need only direct ourselves to a basic question. Do you really want to get your food from a place you would never want to visit? In the post-war decades, the focus was less on questions of origin and manufacture and more on leisure time.
Leisure time became synonymous with wealth, success, and prosperity. Advertisers jumped on board and quickly admonished us to embrace the modern miracles of food production and escape the drudgery of kitchen preparation and cookery. Pre-prepared foods and quick, reliable, and constant fast foods satiated us at a pace commensurate with a population that had exploded onto the new national highway system in a torrid love affair with the automobile and all things speed. Convenience culture was born and we embraced it. Boy, did we ever. We became enamored of the constancy that let us have a hamburger in New York City, tastes exactly the same as a hamburger in Los Angeles and everywhere in between. And this consistent food became safe food, which became predictable food, which became reproducible food. And reproducible food requires reproducible ingredients, which is why a chicken nugget, something that from a culinary perspective should be no more than a handful of ingredients, requires 40 different components to manufacture. But today we must give pause and ask, is consistent food the best food? And whilst we contemplate the question, we hold onto our delivered everything lover slice with an ever tightening death grip. A slice of industrially produced pizza is recognized fairly universally as one of the top 10 most potentially self-destructive things we can and do eat. It is a veritable poster child for a modern Western diet also known as the standard American diet, or most appropriately, quite simply as the SAD. At the heart of the SAD approach is convenience masquerading as efficiency. And ultra-processed manufactured foods masquerading as their authentic forebears, deceiving us with false direction and promise. In 1905, the average American consumed 71 pounds of beef per person per year. In 2010, they ate just 60 pounds. During the same time, veal consumption decreased from seven pounds to less than half a pound. Lamb consumption decreased from six pounds to one pound. Pork decreased from 62 pounds to 48 pounds. Egg consumption likewise decreased from 284 eggs per person per year to 243. All of these decreases are statistically significant. From 1970 to 2005, butter consumption declined 15%, lard consumption declined 47%, and whole milk consumption decreased by 73%. Over the course of the 20th century, Americans' overall consumption of saturated fats has decreased by 21%. Conversely, the consumption of vegetable fats has more than doubled in the 100 years from 1909 to 2009, increasing from 36 pounds to 80 pounds, and by 63% alone from 1970 to 2000. From 1910 to 1970, vegetable fat consumption, primarily in the form of oils, has increased by over 400%. In 1909, Americans consumed 15 pounds of chicken per person per year, and in 2009, that had increased to 80 pounds. Turkey consumption increased from 2 pounds in 1935 to 9 pounds in 2009. From 1910 to 1999, per capita consumption of fish rose from 11.2 to 15.3 pounds per person. These are the results of recommendations based on a one variable, one effect narrative, based on a historically derived viewpoint that no longer applies to the modern table. These are recommendations that Americans were told to follow. And they did. These are the latest obesity statistics from the CDC through 2018, published just a few weeks ago. The average for all states is 42.4%, up from 30.5%, a roughly 40% increase. Severe obesity nearly doubled, going from 47 to 9.2%, and represents amongst the fastest growing segments. You can go ahead and superimpose type 2 diabetes and all the disability and disease associated with it on this map. The singular truth is that not one of the 195 countries on this planet that has seen this rise in obesity and type two diabetes has been able to reverse it. And they all have one thing in common, ever increasing consumption of ultra processed foods. From age five, yes, five onwards, the majority of the US diet consists of ultra processed food. It now makes up almost 70% of the energy we consume each day. And 15% of that comes from added sweeteners alone. Four of the five leading causes of U.S. deaths are chronic disease. These chronic diseases can be prevented and significantly addressed by lifestyle changes like diet. Diets that abound with flavor and texture and deliciousness of real wholesome food. It is clear that the consumption of real foods that have fueled our rise as a dominant species on the planet are not the cause of our current condition. 
A single can of soda a day increases your risk of cardiovascular disease by approximately 30%. The average American now drinks over 50 gallons of soda per year. Over the past three decades, the consumption of high fructose corn syrup has increased by 10,000%. You heard that right, 10,000%. As Dr. Mazafarian of Tufts University notes, the evidence linking chronic disability and disease now strongly points to these ultra processed foods. Research published in 2020 suggests that diets high in ultra processed foods contribute to accelerated physiologic aging at the cellular level as evidenced by shorter telomere length. The evidence is also clear that these ultra processed foods alter in a negative way our symbiotic organ, our gut microbiome. Ultra processed foods are unique. They are constructed to be hyper palatable and addictive. They are designed for profit and long shelf life. Their characteristic ingredients are either food like substances of no or rare culinary use, or else classes of attitude, uh, additives whose function is to disguise the use and flavor of such substances and make them resemble the real foods which they aim to replace. The NOVA classification, developed over a decade ago at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, sheds a light on the dilemma. Here, an authentic pizza napolitano that we described earlier is a group three food. The aforementioned industrial pizza is a group four or ultra processed food. When a pizza is no longer a pizza, we must make a shift. The solution is not easy, but it is not complicated beyond our reach. It requires that we examine ourselves our ecosystem within a larger ecosystem of nature. We are all well aware of the concept of survival of the fittest, of competition for survival in the wild. But both ancient wisdom and modern research reveal that natural systems are at least, if not more, as much about cooperation. There is a universality of the natural world that reveals that everything is connected and functions from systems within systems. Nature regenerates itself with diversity. Culinary medicine is born from this quantum change in our perspective regarding what we eat and who we are. Culinary medicine, as we define it and teach it at the University of Montana, is the multidisciplinary application of evidence-based decision-making in the selection of ingredients and techniques used in preparing foodstuffs with a goal of achieving and maintaining health and wellness through an optimized food experience. The goal of culinary medicine is to change our individual relationship to the food experience. The goal of culinary medicine is to empower the individual to positively reestablish, reconnect, and reforge their relationship to their food experience because this food relationship from the moment we bond with our mothers over breast or bottle is a cornerstone for all the other relationships in our lives. The point of this is to emphasize the power of our positive connections. When we equate people to machines, we quickly lose our way. People are not cars. Food is not fuel. People are part of nature, and nature is a complex, dynamic system in which plants, animals, and fungi are all connected. Within this system, we can find both pleasure and healing, health and happiness. And in the end, is this not the answer we seek? So we come back to our original query and update it for our contemporary times. Tell me. How much ultra processed food do you eat? And for each ingredient you choose, how is it bred? What was it fed? Where was it led? And even with that information, I still cannot tell you who you are. For that unique being is composed not only of the above interrogatories, but also the how, why, where, when, and with whom you eat. It is all those aspects of your food experience that defines who you are. But what I can tell you from those answers is a pretty good idea of your health risk. And I think that's a damn place, damn fine place to start. Industrial agribusiness, big pharma, big food, soda and snack, and international ultra processed food conglomerates have a lot of political clout. They are heavily invested in maintaining the status quo. They relegated Professor John Yudkin to a closet of ignominy, quite literally, a closet at the end of his career. But unlike the professor who had to wait on history to validate his observations and conclusions, we have a moment through collaboration and cooperation and events and conferences like this to create our own positive healing network. Colleagues, friends, today I've had the great honor to share with you some small tasty bits regarding our practice of culinary medicine, its source, how we assemble it, and why we serve it as we do. 
But this is a conference about food as medicine. Food is a powerful healing experience, as all true, real, and authentic foods are. But if we only use food as a therapeutic spear, we miss an opportunity. We run the risk of disconnecting ourselves even further from our food, from our very roots. We run the risk of not awakening to the undeniable truth that all life, our life, is connected. We miss the opportunity to repair our broken covenant with this good earth. So I invite you to join me at the culinary medicine table. It is a feast far richer than you can possibly imagine. Thank you so much for your attention.